Oh. Mm. He wants Ken to do something. Holy shit. Wait, he picked the wrong guy. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Ken is actually more Republican than he thinks he is. Oh, yeah. He probably should switch to our side and get himself right. Hmm. <laughs> I was in <laughs> elementary school. That was the first vote I ever cast. <laughs> Mine too. Ronald Reagan's my first vote. Remember his physical fitness program? Yeah. No, I don't. No? <laughs> Ready? Mr. Hunter. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call the Northampton County Council meeting of May 4th, 2017 to order. Please rise for a moment of silent prayer. Thank you, and please remain standing to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Ms. Zembo, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Fennell? Here. Mr. Kuzik? Present. Mr. D? Here. Mrs. Ferraro? Here. Mr. Geisinger? Present. Mr. Kraft? Here. Mr. Phillips? Here. Here. Mr. Here. All are, All are present this evening. First item is the approval of the minutes of the April 20th, 2017 meeting. Moved by Mr. Werner to approve by acclamation, seconded by Mr. Dietz. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, passes unanimously. Uh, next on the agenda is an update on the population and employment projections. And we have Ms. Becky Bradley here from the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission. Can I hear applause? Thank you Somebody for having me this evening. Um, about every two to four years, depending on what's <coughs> happening in the global economy, uh, we update our population and employment projections. Uh, we do this in partnership with the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, and then uh, these factor into our planning program globally, but they significantly affect how we invest or don't invest in certain uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, you have at your place a hard copy, which is basically uh, a summary of uh, what, what we've come up with. Um, you also have a copy of the Lehigh County, uh, dare I say, versus Northampton County um, mm -hmm. <laughs> employment numbers, so you get a chance to look at, at those as well. But the very cool thing, and this is the first time uh, we've been able to do this, and I'm actually pretty proud of my team for being able to, to learn uh, ArcGIS online and put this together, we now have a 24-7 interactive website that shows what the projections are uh, globally for the county, and then I'll show you some uh, key pieces of it moving forward. And you can just access it by going to our homepage at lvpc.org. So uh, when you click on population employment projections, uh, you get to this web page and you can start to scroll down and it shows you the executive summary for the report. Um, and so we've updated the projections for the 23 top industry uh, sectors for the employment piece and a little bit about uh, the population. It's projected to increase by about 165,000 people between now and 2040 if we can, can continue on the same path that we're on today. That's about a 25.6% uh, increase. Um, I do want to note, too, that it's a little, our growth is a little bit slower than it has been in the last several decades. Right now it's about 0.8% per year. Um, the previous 40 years or so, um, and this that's approximated, it was about um, one percent per year. So we have seen a slight slowing, but it's still growing. Um, and Lehigh County's population is projected to increase by about 8.7 percent, and yours is about to uh, projected to increase by about 8.4 percent. So uh, roughly the same projection. We have about 650,000 people today. So really, what this means is that if we continue on the same growth path at that about 0.8 percent per year, we'll have 813,000 people here by 2040. That is a lot of new people. 
Um, we've obviously seen sustained growth for a number of decades, so we have a lot of things to think through. Um, everything from schools to housing uh, to how uh, we manage our traffic. So the top five municipalities anticipated to grow um, are the city of Bethlehem, and this is just Northampton County only. The okay. city of Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Township, Palmer Township, Forks Township, and the city of Easton. So we have a good growth uh, projection if, if things continue to grow as they have um, <coughs> for not only our suburban communities but our urban communities. I think this is one of the more uh, fun pieces of the website and where the interactivity really comes in is um, you can see the population density really today uh, and we always take things back to the census number because that's how we cross check uh, as we go forward how accurate or inaccurate we were. Um, and the darker green colors show the highest uh, number of people. So you can see it's really along that 2278 corridor. And as you move into 2040, you start to see those outlying areas in between the three cities, uh, Easton, Bethlehem, and Allentown, uh, become a darker green color, which means most of them will continue to add people. And now for the fun part. So if you want to see how much each municipality will grow. If they continue to grow at the same rate that they have um, over the last five years, you can see here that Bethlehem Township has about 23,000, almost 24,000 people today. By 2040, they'll have about 30,000 people, a little bit more. So you can click on any community uh, and pull that information up. Um, and we're also utilizing this to have conversations with our communities as we go forward with the update of the Regional Comprehensive Plan, which we're doing um, on your behalf this year and next year. So what does all of this mean for employment? Right now, there's almost 350,000 jobs uh, in the region as a whole, um, and we anticipate that we'll add uh, quite a few jobs uh, by 2040, about 107,000 jobs, um, which will take us up to 455,000 people. Now again, this assumes no major global economic shifts. That's another reason why we update these every two to four years, because we need to be able to account for what happens in the global economy. But by and large, that's a 31% increase in the total number of jobs that we have uh, in our region. And Northampton County is anticipated to gain uh, 42,373 of those jobs. So that's a, a good, chunk of, good chunk of the jobs. Um, and so that really is um, about a 17.9% job uh, growth. Uh, your previous decade, you had a 14.3% job growth. So you're adding jobs much more quickly now than you were in the previous decade. And of the communities in Northampton County that are anticipated to gain the most jobs, uh, the city of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Township, Forks and Palmer. So it's the same communities that are also adding people. But um, uh, Lower Nazareth Township is also anticipated to add, uh, is in the top five uh, number of uh, job, job generators in the region. And similar to the employment projections, you can uh, look at the overview here, but you can also see where we have the highest job density. Uh, as you would imagine, it's again in between that 2278 corridor, or what a lot of people call the urbanized or suburbanized area of the region. The darker blue means the more jobs uh, there are. So what you start to see when you go into 2040 is everything in the middle in between 22 and 78 becomes a very dark blue color or that dark gray blue color and that the area is immediately adjacent to that. So Allen Township, East Allen Township, those two townships north of the airport, um, Lower Nazareth Township, the areas around Nazareth Borough itself, uh, all are anticipated to gain jobs and same with the other one. Uh, you can click on these and find out how many jobs they're anticipated to add. So we wanted to share this with you um, because really it gives you an indication of some of um, not only the challenges but the opportunities that exist here in the county. Seth. Yeah, I, I'm looking at your projections here and um, it almost looks like they're all positive. Are there any that you're projecting to say shrink at all? Yes, uh, but not many. Okay. On the employment side, uh, federal civilian employment, federal military employment, and agriculture are all anticipated to decline. But otherwise, of those top 22 employment sectors, all are anticipated to increase. 
Um, the one that's anticipated to increase the most is health care and social assistance. If you continue on the same path we've been on for the last four or five years or so, they'll, uh, that's anticipated to add 9,500 jobs into Northampton County alone. And you can look at the comparisons on the yellow and white um, Excel sheet that's at your place as well. Um, administrative and waste management services, uh, and by the way, these are the National Industry Association codes that the federal government uses, or what people call NAICS codes. And I don't know why they lump administrative and office work in with waste management. I wanted to let you know those are actually two different things, but under the same code. So really your gain in jobs is in the administrative side. We drilled down a little bit further on that. The other thing I wanted to let you know, too, is we use a REMI, or Regional Economic Modeling, Inc., to come up with these and actually use an economist to check all of our formulas to make sure they're accurate. And we use uh, base information like development patterns, um, growth in the, the number of uh, uh, delivery addresses for mail, things of those things to make sure that we're cross-checking these appropriately as well. Do you have any questions? I promise I keep it short. Well, I have one. What does this mean for Route 22? Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I have a whole presentation on transportation. If, if you would entertain me some point in the future, I'd love to come show that to you. One of the things that we do know is happening is because of the number of, of people moving into the Lehigh Valley, the number of vehicle registrations is increasing every single year. It's between 0.4 and 0.8%. Um, not only that, now we have uh, a lot of the warehouse logistics uh, industries here which are transportation heavy. Plus, we just have the through traffic coming through the, the region as well. So um, we are improving 22 as fast as we possibly can. The issue is, is we have a fiscally constrained transportation improvement program by federal law, which means we can only allocate money out to projects that we have mm -hmm. uh, available resources for. So we receive about $2.5 billion every 20 years. And if the average cost to replace or repair an interchange tops $20 million, you can see very quickly that that budget doesn't go very far. Um, and so the 22 project that we're doing right now between uh, Airport Road and Route 309, which will take 20 years because it has to be fiscally constrained, comes in at just under $1 billion. Okay. Hmm. Mr. Warner? Um, well, uh, Becky, I, I, I know the growth is, is uh, staggering with the warehousing. I realize that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it looks like the health care and, and the social assistance is one of the largest growth areas. Mm -hmm. the, are there provisions being made for aid to small communities and infrastructures from these larger operations that are moving into the areas when these small communities are being affected by their traffic? Yes, uh, that's one of the things that we actually just met with PennDOT on last week and then again on Monday, this Monday and this Tuesday out in, in Harrisburg. Um, one of the things that we brought to their attention in the federal government yesterday, one of the things that we brought to their attention is this just isn't a freight conversation. I mean, it's okay if, let's say, I'm not trying to pick on Forks Township, but they have a new interchange, right, with a lot of industrial growth around it, but a lot of other growth too. So there'll be some more transportation intensive businesses there. You know, there was private sector money that went into that interchanges along with public money, uh, about mm -hmm. $5 million that came through our transportation improvement program. Um, those developers will do uh, infrastructure improvements around the site, but those trucks aren't necessarily getting on 33 no. at the Shrin interchange. Right. They may be going other places and then those communities are affected. Uh, so we've actually requested um, from PennDOT, and we have to, to follow up with a formal scope in the next couple of weeks, that we do an entire multimodal, intermodal transportation study here to really drill down on uh, designation of, of freight corridors, uh, start to work with the local police departments, state police and the like on the need for enforcement of uh, those routes once they're designated. So you'll start to hear a, a lot more in, in that regard. Though I want to manage expectations. When you ask for money from either the state or federal government, it usually takes a while to get it. So I don't anticipate the study to, to start this year. I, I do hope I'm wrong. Um, but, but again, we're trying to move the ball forward in a positive regard. Because you identified Ms. a really important Thank issue. You. Yeah. Mr. Bennell and then Mrs. Ferraro. 
we, we had discussed this on the way up, and I guess my concern is, and I'm going to piggyback on what Mr. Werner said, and, and I'm going to pick on Lower Nazareth because I live on the border of, I live in Palmer, and I'm on the border there. Um, the problem that Lower Nazareth had is that these, these box warehouses come in, they do the, the zoning studies in the background. So by the time that they propose a warehouse, the municipalities are already hamstrung because they're already zoned for these warehouses to go in and there's nothing that they can do because they certainly don't have the money to fight it. My concern is, and just like we talked on the way up, I've been commuting in from this area for 25 years. Every year it gets worse. And now, just with FedEx's involvement lately, I see the piggyback trucks. They're always in the, left, in the, in the center lanes. They never get over. So you get two trucks racing up a hill. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you have a ton of room on 78 to expand. And I know everybody fo focuses on 22, but the problem is that even if you make eight lanes out by the airport, when you bottleneck it back down to two, it's going to clog up everything. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question would be, is there anything that the Planning Commission can do to get to these little municipalities to say, you know what, you need to rezone it so we don't have box warehouse stores taking up every square inch of living space? This is exactly what we're doing right now. Um, and I want to actually thank you guys for taking a leadership role in, in that. Um, and thank Tim Herlinger uh, as, as well and um, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, what we're doing, and here's the interesting thing, Pennsylvania is a right to develop state. So if you do not go into a multi-municipal plan, then you have to accommodate every use under the sun by state law, even if it doesn't make sense. Like, where are you going to put a quarry in, I don't know, downtown Easton? You're not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but under state law, you have to, unless you go in a multi-municipal plan. Um, the Nazareth area is actually in one now. Now, they can still retain their rights to, to zone as, as appropriate, but there was a court ruling several years ago that allows them to say, okay, everyone in that multi-municipal plan um, can say, all right, I've got this, you've got mm -hmm. that, and then divide up the uses to make a better like basically a sub area plan. Uh, we're working with them and Northampton County to update that plan. And then the slate belt, the first time ever, they're about to kick off a 10 community multi-municipal plan. The kickoff, I, I gave you guys an invite, it's um, May 12th. We're showing some work that was done by students at the University of Pennsylvania, along with the slate belt COG. Uh, to try to, to get people thinking about what the future of that region could be. And their assignment was to show uh, value and unrealized assets. So how do you reuse quarries to, you know, bring uh, revitalization and, and money in, into the economy, that sort of thing. So those two things are very, very important. Once those two plans are updated, we'll have over half of the region's communities in a multi-municipal setting, which should help. Uh, however, it, it's, it's not happening fast enough. We know right now that in planning, some sort of planning or construction, we have over 23 million square feet of new warehouse and logistics being planned in the Lehigh Valley right now. We're doing a whole presentation on it uh, on May 22nd at the, at the freight, freight Committee. This yeah. is for our... Uh, I've looking at these opportunities for employment opportunities, and we have many students uh, here with us this evening. What kind of jobs are they, I mean, we see these breakdowns, but are these living wage jobs? Are they just a whole variety? For example, with health care and social assistance, there's just the whole, they run the gamut, basically. They, they do, um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges for, for our, our region. Um, there will be some high wage jobs there. I don't know if you if you notice, but educational services, which is Lehigh University Lafayette, or in right. those two codes, those see a substantial increase. Those will be higher wage jobs, obviously, than you would have in the transportation or logistics mm -hmm. sector. This also assumes that things will continue on the same path that they have for the last mm -hmm. four to five years. So, um, as robotics become more uh, normal in warehouse logistics facilities, then I believe those numbers will drop. Okay. Right now, we're an untapped retail market, according to uh, private sector folks, and so we're going to see a spike in retail here, but as we order more online, long term, those will decline. So that's why I keep bringing up the point, you know, these are probably only good for the next five mm -hmm. years, and that's why we'll continue to update them as we go forward. But we've always wanted to keep our young folks here in mm -hmm. the valley. and. Okay. And make sure we have jobs for them. Yes. 
Anything else for uh, Ms. Braille? Yep, Mr. Vaughn. Uh, I, kn I know there was some discussion, I think maybe Hayden brought it up um, previously, about you, the Planning Commission for the Lehigh Valley, quite possibly being absorbed to more broad regional Planning Commission. Is that still talk or? Well, we are right now, you know, a two county planning commission. Um, interestingly enough, it made it to Donald Trump's desk today. Uh, the MPO reform uh, legislation that was attempted to be done by the Obama administration, which would have created a nine state metropolitan planning organization from Boston through to DC, that was actually um, over, it was a, 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 an executive uh, order. Um, that was uh, voted down in the Senate, then by the House, and so now it's uh, um, now it's on the president's desk. Hopefully, he signs it now, um, because that will take a lot of heat off of organizations like ours around the country. But we would literally lose control of all of our transportation funding. So every metropolitan planning organization across the country and rural planning organizations that were affected basically band together. All the state DOTs and said this wasn't a good idea. So. Um, Hopefully we're out of the woods, but we'll see. Next few few days should tell us. Great. I, I had one thing based on what came up earlier this evening, and that was, um, and you just raised the issue, the loss of retail. Um, is that something you are planning for long term? Because uh, we're seeing, you know, Kmart's closing and Sears and some of the old time retailers are closing stores. H how do you plan for that? Um, it's one of the reasons why I have a, a community design professional in our office now. Um, we hired her in July. Um, we have to revision and rethink our retail corridors. Um, a lot of strip centers will be vacant in our lifetime, certainly, um, and it could be in the nearer term uh, in some cases. So we're going to have to figure out how to keep those properties viable and the tax income coming in so we can do other things like maintain our, our roads and our schools and, and the like. Um, so we have to, to really pinpoint those areas and come up with redevelopment strategies for them. It's something that I'm really personally committed to as well as professionally committed to. The job piece is obviously handled by Workforce Investment Board, Lehigh Valley Economic Development Corporation, but on the land use piece, mm -hmm. we're going to do more. It's one of the reasons why we're updating the regional comprehensive plan right now, too, because we need to think out on that 10 and 20 year time horizon. Right. Anything else for uh, Ms. Bradley? I just, just, Mr. Warner. And Becky, you may not even be able to answer this. I don't know, it just came up. It's been talked about this is kind of a new term, the question of impervious service, mm -hmm. uh, surface, uh, uh, Invasion? Are you are you taking that into consideration because of all the asphalt and all the concrete and everything that's happening with all the runoff? Oh yeah, um, and we. I'll, oh yes, because the federal law has changed in, in that yes. regard. So um, we've partnered up with uh, the Northampton County Conservation District, Lehigh County Conservation District, and DEP, and we're doing more uh, training and education with our municipal officials. We're also trying to figure out. Um, how we can help them meet those MS4 requirements yeah. because it's going to be very difficult on everyone. It's basically the EPA forcing additional regulations yes. down on down They're going to be us. taxed on, on the surface, correct? They uh, On the square footage? In the most simplistic sense, I would say so, but it's inherently, it's a rabbit hole okay. of, of technical detail. We are releasing green infrastructure guidelines for the region. Um, our first crack at that uh, on or around June 30th, too. So we're moving in that direction as well. And, and there's okay. been some inspirational stuff happening yeah. in this county and in Lehigh to, to try to, to manage that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's you. informative as always. always. All right. Uh, next on the agenda was courtesy of the floor. We had no one signed up. Uh, is there anyone that would like to address council this evening? Uh, there being none, we'll move into the controller's report. Mr. Barron, did you have anything for us? Okay. Uh, next is the executive's report. Mr. Brown. Hi, good evening, Council. Welcome. Uh, just a couple of uh, points I'd like to use this time for. First of all, I, I do want to inform Council and acknowledge uh, Dan Keene. Uh, Dan. Uh, at the recent um, association meeting was that was uh, elected president of the Pennsylvania Prison Wardens Association. Wow. That's just not just county, that's state and county. 
and as I learned in talking to Dan about it, it's a, it takes, uh, you, you haven't moved through this, it takes almost eight years mm -hmm. to even be in a position to be uh, honored in that way. So we're, we're very fortunate Dan uh, joined Northampton County. Um, in, uh, I'd like to follow up on the memo that was issued by the controller uh, last week regarding training and travel. Uh, Ms. Trapp, uh, as I, uh, Councilor had asked, uh, is here. I'd like her to come forward. Uh, and then I have a follow up um, to, uh, to her comments. Good evening, Council. I'm sorry I wasn't here last time. I had a, an unfortunate run in with someone who not only ran into but drove away from my car. So um, the good news is I get a new car. And I'm okay. Um, so I just wanted to address a couple of things. I've, I have some concerns with the memo that Mr. Barron had presented with regard to um, accuracy of information, and I wanted to take the opportunity to address that information for you and if you had any other questions for me. Um, I know that two of the questions were locations of the conferences. One was in um, Las Vegas. That conference was for a product that we use called NeoGov. It is uh, specifically geared toward public sector employers for the purposes of recruitment. We spend $28,000 a year on this product, $6,000 of which is an integration of testing that um, feeds into the system. At the time this system was installed, it was, it was prior to my arrival, but the person who utilizes the system was not properly trained on it, and the other person who went to this conference was um, the, de the new deputy director of human resources and his responsibility is technology. And so they were the two who did go to, um, to the conference. Um, if there's only one conference, once a year. This is where it was located. There's not the opportunity to procure or secure this information in any other manner than through the national conference for NeoGov. Um, so I, I wanted to touch base on that. And then the other piece was um, the one in uh, New Orleans. The deputy director also went to that. Um, the county as a, an employer of 2,200 people is very large. Prior to the arrival of this administration and, and me as the HR director, there was no one who was solely focused on workman's compensation. And when an employee would get hurt, they may or may not be out of work for a certain amount of time, but there was no management of that. Management of workmen's compensation or workers' compensation was essentially filling out the papers, turning it over to the third party administrator and allowing them to manage the process. Um, so it was important to have somebody who was focused and educated on this. This conference, again, national conference, um, 2,000 people attended every year. We consulted with our third party or third party administrator, ACS, who manages our claims. They said it's a very good conference. They go to it every year. and felt like it would be a good educational experience for the deputy director. Um, so I sent him to that as well. Um, and just from a results perspective, I, I want to touch base on a couple of things um, with regard to hiring and turnover. Well, let me back up. Let's do workman's comp first. So in 2015, we had 30 lost time claims and spent $1.4 million in our workman's comp claims, total spend. In 2016, after um, refining the process, creating a robust return to work program, having someone who's solely focused in with the intention to get them educated, we had 17 lost time claims and our spend was $595,000. So we had a 57% reduction in our spend and 43% reduction in our lost time claims. Um, I feel like that's a significant impact and a really positive um, thing for the county. With regard to NeoGov and onboarding and hiring, it's streamlined the system, it's made it paperless. Um, there are still areas of the system that we don't use, so we're working to implement those. Now that we've had a home rule charter change with the referendum that was approved last year, it allows us to advertise electronically. We still do post internally on bulletin boards for the sake of employees who don't have access to electronic only resources. Um, however, all external postings are now electronic because that's just the way of the world um, these days. 
with regard to, well, I want to hold on the metrics for that for one second. I just want to touch on a couple of other things um, that I think are, are positives and maybe was a little bit of confusion. Um, there was a reference to some training that was done for the Department of Human Resources, $7,050 uh, for the, communicate, for the communi community college, excuse me, for five employees in the HR department. Uh, it was, the, the spend was actually $8,460, and it was six people. Only one of them was someone from HR. There was um, an employee from Graysdale who works in housekeeping. There was someone from the jail, public works, an RN supervisor, and someone from human services. So the intention was to allow employees across the employee population to be trained. In addition to that, we um, spent $5,500 on crisis prevention for Graysdale after the unfortunate event that occurred there with an attempt for suicide. Um, one of the things that we did as a remediation and in an attempt to ensure moving forward we were in a good position was to provide training and um, have staff development employees go to that training. And so that was a spend um, in a positive direction for that. Um, other than that, you know, some other trainings that were done, we, we spent uh, a little over $1,000 on training, emotional intelligence training. We offered managers um, the opportunity to go to the training. It was provided through SHRM. We also provided uh, an HR Essentials um, course for supervisors, partners, partnered with SHRM. We spent, I think, um, a little over $1,200 for that. And then another um, area for this bucket that I think maybe has not been considered or, or was not aware is um, testing. For outside candidates, merit personnel system requires that we have validated tests in order to ensure that we're testing properly and bringing in candidates who are qualified relative to the tests that they're taking. And we pay for those tests out of this, um, out of this bucket as well. So, you know, back in, in 2014, 15, sorry, 2015, when we look at the $5,700 spend, a good portion of that was for this testing. So we've, we continue to do that, but we've certainly expanded um, the services provided to employees. And when we look at what some of the outcomes of those things are, um, I know I touched base on the workman's comp so far, but I want to I want to touch base on a couple of other things. When I arrived in 2015, there were 15 open EEOC claims. Ten of them were new claims for 2015. Four, five were um, existing ones that were still open. In 2016, there were three EEOC claims. So the focus on training, the focus on support really makes a difference in the area of whether or not employees feel that they're treated equitably and need to go to an outside source to mitigate an issue that they have. Uh, with regard to hiring and turnover, in 2015, we had to hire 420 employees. In 2016, we had to hire 331, um, and that was because our turnover was down. In 2015, we had 424 employees turnover. That does not include retirements. There were about 60 retirements in 2015. In 2016, we had 337 people resign um, or leave. and. Um, 48 of those, in addition to those 337, 48 were um, retirements. So we turned over 87 less employees. Uh, our turnover in 2015 was almost 20%. In 16, it was under 15%. And the standard for um, public sector in the government is about 12 to 15%. In the private sector, it's about 25% in a year that you'll turn over. Um, there's a little more stability. Employees tend to stay longer in the public sector. Um, the other thing that I look at because it's something that I was trained to look at is first year survival rate. So you hire new employees, you bring them in, how many of those new employees make it through their first year? In 2015, the 124 employees turned over during that first 12 month period. So of the 420 who were hired, 124 turned over in that first year. So their first year survival rate was 69.8%. In 2016, of the 331 employees who were hired, 77 turned over in their first year. So our first year survival rate was 76.7%. The benchmark for first year survival in the, in the private sector at least um, is 75%. So I know the spend has increased. I think 
a couple of things that are important for me to say are this is not a bucket for HR. This training is for the county. Some of it belongs to HR, some of it belongs to other departments because our goal was to be able to provide services to employees to bring their skills to a point where they can service the subordinates or the people who roll up to them because you're only as strong as your weakest link and if your managers aren't trained and prepared, they're not helping anyone. And as an HR person, I'm a risk manager. And EEOC claims are a very telling tale when it comes to why an employee would feel they needed to go to an outside agency to act on their behalf. And there was a significant, a significant reduction in that. And, and I would like to say supportive management. That, that's not an HR result. That's our support and our customer service to the managers and the employees of the county that had an effect on that. Do you have any questions? Hmm? I, well, I, one thing that kind of bothered me, sure. and I didn't mention it, was that there were, appeared to be an allegation that bills were deliberately held from one budget year to the next. So I have the answer to that. I, I wasn't going to specifically address that. I, I wanted to focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if anyone has the memo in front of them. Um, but I'll read, the par I'll read the paragraph that I think that you're talking about. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, in closing, it's important to bring this to your attention now, since the cost for this line item is already at $19,906.26 as of 412. At the end of 2016, there was a discussion of budget transfers to pay a vendor that, un that ultimately led to a bill being paid in 2017. In the email attached, Duran Hammond said to one of the disbursement staff that there was no more money to move in 2016. The bill was paid in the 1-6-2017 check run when there was money in the budget to cover the expenses. The email exchange is attached to the bill that was paid in 2017 as justification for holding the bill and delaying payment. Well, this is... Um, there seems to be some confusion because this is not accurate. If you look at the exhibits which were attached to the memo, there is an exhibit number eight. As soon as I get to it, I'll show it to you. So there are two things I wrote exhibit number eight on. I think I got confused. They were behind a page that listed them. One is an email between my secretary and someone who works in disbursement. And the email talks about, I'm going to enter this invoice, it's showing that it's over budget. So within our budgets, we, have, we, we are able to move money. Um, my secretary had said, you know, I'm trying to get a budget adjustment, Duran hasn't been in the office because at the end of the year, we work with the budget administrator to make sure that we're moving money around the way that we need to. Um, and so they couldn't, the, the issue in this email that seems to cause a confusion is that the check run was that day, the week of Christmas, and so coming up on the holiday, there wasn't going to be an opportunity in 2016 to have another check run. Um, the email ends with, you know, nobody was responding, she wasn't able to get in touch with someone, and the employee from disbursement said, I spoke to Duran, and he said not to pay it because there's no more money to move. So. That was specific to that check run. This invoice, which was paid on a check run for January 6th of 2017, in the uh, documents that were attached at the end, and mine have all kinds of writing on them because I was making sure I had all my information correct, but in the set of documents that is called GL transactions by object code with org key activity through 1231-2016. This invoice number 1997914 appears on page four in the next to last line, booked as 1231-2016 for the amount of $1,210. We don't close our books at the end of the year they have to roll in and we have a run out period mm -hmm. for paying our bills. The confusion appears to be that we couldn't get it in that check run before Christmas, which was the last one of the year. It did run in 2017, that is accurate, but it was booked to 2016, 
and mm. we did make a transfer within our budget to take care of it. Does that is that what you were looking for? That's when you said it, I thought that might be what it was. <laughs> that is exactly what troubled me, and I understand your explanation. Thank I'll you. I'll give you the papers if you would like to have them. <laughs> if you want to submit them for the record, we'll certainly take them. You can have my there are my chicken scratches on them, but I absolutely will. Mr. Dietz, just a question: How do we check, like, for like they're getting about hotel rates, or do we have a do we shop around, or are we doing? I mean, I guess my answer to that is I don't know that we have a very specific policy for that. I will say that the the conventions that the people that I sent, they stayed at the location yeah. where the convention was held in Las Vegas, and. The reason for that was because they didn't have to have transportation. To go two blocks on Las Vegas Boulevard is $20. So to try to send them from one place to another and back at the beginning and the end of the day would have resulted in an increased cost. Can I tell you that that was the cheapest rate in this moment? I can't. I can't go backwards. But it was the conference rate. They were at the facility. There was no reason to need to venture out, I mean, to get something to eat, obviously, but to have to worry about transportation back and forth, it, it, it appeared to be the best place for them. I certainly will take the feedback that, can we try to negotiate a little more in the future? Sure. I think that's reasonable. I don't know if that's what you were headed towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, there's a way, you know, with, of course, my job, we travel all the time, and, and we have a, a checks and balance that we're, you know, and we're tax exempt, but we're not, we're sales tax exempt, we're not exempt from every tax. So when we travel, we do make sure that we take an exempt certificate, but that doesn't always relieve every tax, depending on what it is. And then the only other question I had was the, uh, you know, the Workman's Com Conference. You know, I realize that the Neo Gov one, I mean, that's the only place to have it, you know, that's one thing. But the Workman's Comp, I mean, that seems to be pretty much everywhere, and even in Pennsylvania. We, he, yeah. he, he went to the one in Pennsylvania in Hershey, but this, this national conference had an audience that a local conference wouldn't have, and that is why we consulted with our vendor to ensure that we weren't being frivolous in the approach to that. Okay. Mr. Warner? Uh, are you, I'm glad to, you're back and you're feeling well. Are you Thank feeling you. better? Other than the Band-Aid yeah. on my nose, my nose is No one asked you, and I'm going to ask you to make sure you're okay. I'm great, Mr. Okay. Warner. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. That being said, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be great now? <laughs> no, no. Oh, You're okay. fine, okay? Um, you went there. I mean, we've talked about the NeoGov uh, operations for a while now, since you started, okay? And one of the things about the NeoGov on page two of its program is that with the new systems, administrative work and maintenance costs would be reduced, okay? That's the, that's the whole idea of NeoGov, okay? Yet there have been increases. There have been, there's a cost involved, $28,000 a year. The and there's a six thousand dollar tag on that just for the yeah. testing. So I would assume that we were getting our money's worth somewhere. Okay, but that's not my real question. When you were asked by Mr. Dietz, you know how you handled your expenses, and and this is a this is not in a negative fashion. I just want to point something out. Sure. You're in charge of the policies, the travel, meal mileage, reimbursement. You oversee that. You you arranged this trip, correct? I allowed. I approved my employee to go, yes. And you, so you did the research on the travel? I allowed him to stay at the facility where yeah, the conference was You didn't go was through an, an agency like Mr. Dietz or myself would? No. I didn't know that that was an option for us, actually. Well, on, on page two, there are uh, types of travel on page three and four of the travel meal reimbursement program for the county. It says, employees shall attempt to obtain government rates or lower. Did you do that? I don't know that we asked for a government rate. No, I don't know. But I also will add, and I didn't well, add this. Well, no, no, let me interrupt you a minute. Now, you said you made the arrangement. I did not make the arrangements. I permit. I approved for my staff to go. So who made the arrangements with the He made logic? the arrangements. Who, he, he who? My deputy director. So did the deputy director know of the policy to ask for a discounted rate as a government entity? I don't know. I, I will follow up with him. 
Okay, well, I'm pointing this out because it's Absolutely. within your purview Absolutely. to understand those things, and okay? The, the, and I, I, don't, I don't want to, for this to come off as defensive, but the, the thing that they also did not do was expense mileage to and from the airport. They did not expense parking and they did not expense their meals because they were conscious of the optics. Well, I think we're all conscious of the optics of expenditures, okay? Sure. But the fact is that I think the optics on the way this was done was kind of hard for the public to, to hear and understand, okay? only because it was Vegas. And I, anyone that's been to Vegas knows that there's a, it's dropped out of the sky and it's in the middle of the desert. And everything is clumped in a four or five block radius, okay? You can walk to the Sands Hotel, you can walk. And there are Best Westerns and there are Hiltons. And you don't have to take a $20 taxi to the, across the street or down two or three blocks. But my point is this, okay? This was absolutely in your area of expertise that we brought you in on with your skill set that you were to bring to the county to oversee these people that you bring in to bring accountability and ex uh, control expenses and to also encourage the, the education of these people, sure. okay? I am going to say that I don't think this was done as well as it could have been. Sure, I'll take that feedback. And I'm not, this is not a beat up or anything like that. I just, from a, a, a viewpoint of a person that traveled and used expense reports, we haven't, we didn't hear anything about any reporting back on what the, the ROI was on this, even though you're using statistics from 2015 and 16. Mm -hmm. But it might be helpful if the council finds out what the impact was of those trips. Sure. And I think we have the right to ask for those reports every I mean, once in a while. Absolutely, and, and we talked about the um, we talked about the workman's comp piece. Yes. I mean, the, you know, seven hundred thousand dollar savings overall from one year to the next. Yes. Well, I just I just wanted to point that out, and I don't want to be nasty because I know you don't feel good, and and I'm trying to be as polite as I can with it. But I believe there were questions here that should have been reviewed before the trip that would have made it a little bit easier in terms of of how to digest it. Okay. Okay. Kind of to follow up what Bob was saying, you know, the optics don't. Oh, my, sorry, the optics don't look the best when you talk about Las Vegas. Um, but I, I would like to point out that Las Vegas hosts thousands and thousands of conferences every year, and they're actually a, one of the rather cheaper venues to actually go to for conferences. I know this because I go to a conference every year. Uh, for my for my job, they they encourage us to continue our educations, and uh, you know, I, I look through these conference dates every year, and you know, I went to one in Florida the other year, and it was so much more expensive than the Vegas trip. So, I, just to put it in a little bit of perspective, I know it, it sounds like Vegas is, you know, gambling and lots of money, but it actually, from a conference standpoint, it's actually on the rather cheaper aspect. Than as opposed to other conferences, so I just want to point that out. The other thing I want to point out is is I'm actually, you know, encouraged that the HR director is going out of her way to educate her staff to look for efficiencies within her department and to kind of seize these opportunities and 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 find these opportunities that where she can you know save us some money. I mean, clearly a million dollar savings in one year to the next is is a return on investment no matter how you look at it so I, I I'm actually encouraged by some of this this discussion okay well, thank you for coming and I'll echo mr. Werner's comments I'm glad you're feeling better thank you. Um, you know I think the power word of all this is is the optics of it we use it at the last council meeting we use it at this council meeting uh, I agree with mr. Werner that the way it was presented was not the best for anybody involved HR council the county um, my my question is and this is really a, a redundant is because when that report came through my email and I read it the first person I contacted was you mm -hmm. and I had asked you if you had seen it and, I had and, not. You, and you had not so I again I forwarded to you so you had the chance to read it you you know given because it was right after the car accident you did tell me that given your situation you could you could explain everything that was there uh, I'm glad you came here tonight to explain it. Um, and what I said at the last council meeting rings true for what I'm saying now. This is nothing more than a political hit piece. And I'm going I'm to address the gorilla in the room. And that is, if this was presented to council as an audit, as an investigation, it was a poor excuse for one. Because when I talk to the HR director after a letter like that comes out, 
and is basically it has nothing to do with fact. It's just nothing but inflammatory because a simple sit down would have addressed all those concerns. And I'm not saying it shouldn't come before council. We have every right to understand why that why the conferences were attended, what was learned. I agree with Mr. Werner, Mr. Vaughn. We should have we should have it discussed on the on the money saved, the return on investment. Um, but that being said, when there's when there's a quote unquote audit, when there's no letter of engagement sent to the HR department, no no contact with the HR department to say this is why I'm doing this before I go out and I and I hit the papers with such falsehoods. Again, false news, I'll bring it up. Uh, it does bother me. And we are in the political season. We have five at large seats. Again, I'm not running. So this has nothing to do with my political career because come, come January 1st, I'm gone. This has everything to do with what this council has to endear, endure for the next six months. And I think Mr. Barron, through his control, now this has nothing to do with the controller's department because I think that, that staff is excellent. I think anybody could get in that position and look good. Now, there is a history of this going on, and I'm going to address this after Ms. Trapp is gone, if I may. Uh, but my opinion on this report, it was just nothing more than to come back after HR for HR restricting Mr. Barron's access after he showed a prior employee's information on a news network. And when, when HR took steps, he should have never, that, that, that access should have never been granted in the first place, because that's personnel. The controller is only here for internal control of fiscal transactions. That former employee's information had nothing to do with fiscal transactions. And for that information to be posted out on, on the media was completely false. So HR steps in and takes away that access. No fiscal, no fiscal records were held from the controller. No information where it regards the fiscal is being withheld from the controller. Just personnel information. And because he got his hand slapped, this is nothing more than a retaliatory tract. And now, again, we have to answer for it as counsel when it could have been a simple, open and honest question and answer with, with HR. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Brown, you had some additional comments. <clears throat> if you, uh, in the um, workup that was done, if you look at the uh, uh, staff training and development, there were two, two large areas of increases that the controller pointed out, HR being one. The second was in the Department of Corrections uh, and was attributed to staff increases. But actually, the, the money that was spent was actually far more significant in, in, in uh, creating some things. I'd like uh, 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 Dan Keene to just come in uh, very quickly, expand on what that money um, was spent for and why we reallocated those monies uh, going forward. Good evening. My face always looks like this. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have a motto in training. When you fail to train, you train to fail. In my world, we can't deal with that. If we don't train in our world or in corrections, someone's going to get hurt, someone's going to get killed. In 2016, we had an approved budget that we could train all the staff. For my staff, a total of 267 members it was one of the first times in Northampton County Department of Corrections history that all the staff received the mandatory trainings needed from the state and federal regulations. In addition to that, we have special teams. We have a CERT team, we have a FERT team. CERT teams like the police SWAT team. Anytime we have an emergency situation, we call on a CERT team to come in and take care of business. They have to train for that. We have a FERT team. If we happen to have a fire, they know what to do to respond. Putting the SCBA tanks on, donning their equipment to go in and rescue not only staff members, but rescue the inmates to come out. We have a gang unit. Guess what? We have gangs in Northampton County. You want to know how good your town is, how, how good the uh, county is? Come inside the jail. You'll find out you'll see what's going on. We have an honor guard. The honor guard is there to represent fallen comrades, you know, ceremonies and so forth. In addition to, most recently, mental health has gone through the roof. 
Mm. So we're working towards getting everyone CIT trained. We have 200 officers on the floor. We get about 78 of them right now trained in CIT. And that's to assist them to deal with individuals that suffer from mental health. We're also working, and I've explained it several times before, we had to get train, uh, staff training in LSCMI. That's to get the risk needs assessment for new inmates coming in so we can better not only classify them, but start getting them lined up for certain uh, programs to make them better once they go out into society to hopefully prevent them from recidivating. You know, and uh, we have PREA. I don't know if you guys are on this view of PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act. That's a federal regulation. Each year we need this. Each year we need suicide prevention. Each year we need use of force. Each year we need firearms. Every academy we have, we go through five, six, seven thousand rounds because we have a transport team. We have to train on that. When something happens in my world, if an inmate gets killed, inmate commits suicide, somebody's assaulted, first thing they pull is policy, second thing they pull is training. And if you're not there, we're all on, on the hook. So I'm very proud, I'm very excited. Uh, for the 2016, we had a fantastic year. We had some grumbling, but you know what? The staff were fantastic. They met all the requirements. They went through all the training that was required. And guess what? We're getting ready to do it again. We had to hit those mandatory trainings every year. You know? And on top of just trying to get the specialized training coming in. Uh, right now, uh, we're getting ready to prepare to uh, start doing ICS, Incident Command System. God forbid, look at what happened in Delaware, in the state of Delaware. Individuals taken hostage. They had to run Incident Command. That's training. 2015, Northumberland County burnt down. They were able to evacuate 267 inmates out of that facility because of why? They trained. In addition, in 2015, Adams County, Gettysburg, PA, had an active shooter in their lobby. An inmate came in, or not an inmate, a civilian came in, put a gun, a gun in an officer's face and said, you're going to die today. Turned right around, went back outside. and. The reason, one of the reasons that we believe that she wasn't killed that day is because of her training. So when it comes to training, I take it near and dear to my heart because at the end of the day, it depends on who's going to walk out at the end of the day to see their loved ones at home. So like I said, just in closing, I just want to say for us, you know, we train and that's what we do to make sure we can go home and make sure everyone else goes home. So, all right. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else, Mr. Um, Brown? Just to conclude, I, I apologize. I know it took a little longer than normal, but I thought right. it was important to uh, bring those uh, matters forth. Uh, Mr. Warner, to your point, uh, and uh, I think Seth used, uh, Mr. Bond used the term return on investment ROI. Um, we're, the administration is constantly making sure if we're spending dollars that we do get uh, a dollar plus back in return. Uh, for that, we can always tighten it up and improve on how we're doing it, and we'll, we'll take those uh, comments into uh, uh, consideration as we move forward. And uh, I thank Council's indulgence uh, uh, on this matter. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next is uh, old business. We had nothing on the agenda. Is there any old business, uh, Mr. Bennell? Um, just technically, because I did bring it up at the last meeting, I'd, I'd like to just stay on the same line of uh, conversation that I just had. Um, I'm going to ask this council, um, not tonight, but I, I think that there is a history of, of the controller violating uh, the Home Rule Charter, the Administrative Code, uh, the Electronics Code. If you look into um, when when he addressed this council when he addressed the media uh, having that person's information up i know that uh, you know we did look at it, ways the, of, of punishment but there just seems to be a history here of the controller violating um really what the what the office is supposed to do violating uh, ethics 
Uh, we'll go back to the T-Mobile deal. Uh, we'll go back to, um, again, the controller's department. There's no other employment. One of the things I'd like this council to do is vote on a referendum that allows the, uh, a controller of this county to have other employment. One of the things I've heard from both sides of the aisle is the reason why we don't get qualified candidates to take that position is because for the money that it pays, uh, you have to give up that employment. So even if you have a retired CPA, they usually still keep on one or two of their clients, and that's additional employment. And those people don't want to go step up. So that's why we, we have what we have. My other issue is, and I, and I can lay this out, and I, I will plan to get with Mr. Lauer to get some legal opinions on exactly what council can do, because as I read through the Home Rule Charter and the Administrative Code, all I see is violations, 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 but there's nothing in there that gives anybody teeth except for if, it, if there, there's a conviction. Now, what concerns me is when I read back in April, I don't know, I think it was the Express Times, had in their reporting that Mr. Morganelli, when he was running for Commonwealth District Attorney had exceeded his goal of fundraising. And, I, and by no means do I want this construed, taken in any way that I'm coming down on, on Mr. Morganelli. I think the best thing that happened in Northampton County is John Morganelli is our DA. I think he's doing a fantastic job. I may take a hit politically for saying that. I don't care his political affiliation. I think he's doing a fantastic job. And the last thing he needs to hear either tonight or tomorrow morning is, is me droning on. But in his expense accounts, which I pulled from the state's website, Steve Barron was paid $22,110 from the DA for use of for phone services. And I have the information here. And f again, you're talking about a third of his salary. I also have the ethics financial form that each one of us elected officials is supposed to fill out. And on that form, it talks about the county controller position refereeing spots, which again is a technicality, it is a violation of, of the Home Rule Charter. But we've decided to let that go amongst everything else. But when you make $22,000 plus on renting your equipment to the DA, and when he's running for a candidate, and that's, that's a third of the salary, I think there's a huge issue there. We're not talking about a piddly refereeing a soccer game, or refereeing a, a football game, which has nothing to do with county business. The controller's position is to have financial oversight of every aspect of the county. $22,000 it wasn't reported on an ethics form. And again, contact the Ethics Commission. Even if they do an investigation and they find that there, there's some improprieties, there's nothing they can do. So again, with the Home Rule Charter and the Administrative Code, we're at a quandary. But this issue has been kicked down the, down the road, and it is back on our laps that we have a con an elected official who continues to run buckshot in this county. He's nothing, nothing more than a corrupt officer. And enough is enough. And again, maybe I'm the best one to say it because I'm not seeking re-election, and this can't be pinned on me that I'm trying to get re-elected. But again, somebody has made an extra third of their salary renting equipment. Now, maybe there's no impropriety. I'm so happy that you know the, the, the district attorney put it out there on his report just like he should have. But the fact remains, even we talk about optics, the optics of this stinks. And something needs to be done, and I'm going to urge this council, we have to figure out a way that we have to say enough is enough. I'm of the opinion that because we, we, we outside of asking for an independent investigator to look into this, I, I ha, I'm of the opinion that I think the controller's position should be defunded. And at some point at the next meeting, I'm going to ask council to consider that or to consider a measure that, that we dig in our heels and say, you know what, enough is enough. We have to sit through presentations where our human resource director is put on the fire pit for, for a, a, an inflammatory report, and then after hearing the accolades that our, that our warden just received, he has to come up here and defend HR and, and say how the training is important to his unit, when all this could have been taken care of with a simple meeting. Then the report that comes to council says, here's what happened, here's the optics, here's the research, Here's what I found. And it's council's purview to say, you know what, we want to follow up with what was our return on investment. But again, I refuse to sit here for another six, seven months and hear nothing but political hit pieces come out of the controller's office. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Any other old business? Okay, next we'll move into new business. Uh, first item on the agenda is the consideration 
of the General Purpose Authority Lafayette College Resolution, and I'll call on Mrs. Ferraro to introduce that resolution. Okay, and I will just go to there, um, now therefore be it resolved, and um, you you would like me to read that, correct? Yeah, just yeah. there, yeah. And, uh, and then we'll get to Mr. Becker. Okay. It is hereby determined and declared pursuant to the Authorities Act that it is desirable for the health, safety, and welfare of the people in the area served by the college for the authority to undertake the financing of the project through the issuance of bonds in one or more series and issues at a fixed rates of interest in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $170 million. The issuance not to exceed $170 million based on issue price in aggregate principal amount of the bonds and the financing of the project are hereby approved for the purpose of Section 147F of the Code subject to the approval um, of the issuance of the bonds by the county executive um, and the delivery of said county executive of a certificate of approval in substantially the form attached here to his Exhibit B and presented to the county council the day following the necessary hearing concerning the project and the bonds with such changes as the county executive shall deem appropriate and the clerk of the county council is hereby directed to attest her signature the execution of such certificate to be conclusive evidence and the approval by the county executive of the issuance of the bonds of the project. The foregoing determination, a lot of words here, folks, mm -hmm. declaration and approval are for the purposes of the applicable provisions of the Authorities Act and the Code as or aforesaid and do not constitute approval for any permit, license, or zoning required for the construction or occupancy of any facilities to be financed or refinanced as part of the project. Um, the credit of the County of Northampton is not to be used for the security of the bonds and the County of Northampton will have no liability for any payment of principal of premium, if any, and interest of the bonds, and all actions of the County Council taken in conformity with the intents and purposes of this resolution are ratified, confirmed, and approved in all aspects, and this resolution shall take effect immediately. All prior ordinances or resolutions or portions thereof inconsistent herewith are hereby repealed. And in my experience on Council, many, many, many of these health um, welfare resolutions have come before for hospitals and many fine institutions of higher learning. And we're very happy to have with us this evening Mr. Craig Becker, who is going to give us your title and tell us a little bit more about the project. Sure, thank you. Good evening. I'm Craig Becker. I'm the Associate Vice President for Finance and Business at Lafayette College. I first want to thank the Council for its long-standing support of the college. It's very much appreciated. Uh, the college will be breaking ground uh, next week for a new integrated sciences center. Our existing facilities were built in 1969, and it's time for, to, for the college to renovate and expand its STEM research. Uh, so we will be breaking ground on a new integrated science center for $75 million, the estimated cost, uh, to be financed. Uh, we are also uh, renovating some additional academic buildings on the main campus for another $5 million for a total of $80 million of new monies. We will be refinancing about $73.4 million of our series 2008 bonds. And just for clarification, I know I, I mentioned this at the Economic Development Committee meeting also, but uh, there's been some controversy about the expansion of dormitories and so forth, housing, mm -hmm. and uh, this bond issue has nothing to do with that. So that when correct. you're weighing in on your vote for this particular uh, resolution, it's very straightforward, okay? Uh, any further discussion on uh, Mr. Dietz? And I, I guess just clarification on, so you'll, you'll take the bond out, and then, so who is it that pays the bond back? The college pays the bond back okay. over the mature, life of the maturity. 
Any other questions or discussion, Mr. Warner? No, just for clarification, for everybody's sake, it, this is all on campus, $80 million worth of construction. That's correct. This is all on main campus. And it's for a STEM, it's for science, technology, and, uh, and for a science center, and does not include an aquarium. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, Ms. Zembo, can we call the vote? Mrs. Ferrara? Yes. Mr. D? Yes. Mr. Geisinger? Yes. Mr. Kraft? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Vaughn? Yes. Mr. Warner? Yes. Mr. Fennell? Yes. Mr. Cusick? Yes. Passes by a vote of 9 to 0. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing this building. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. All right, uh, that's all we had under new business. Uh, is there any other new business to come before council this evening? Okay. Uh, there being none, we'll move into the next item, uh, council committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? Yes, mm -hmm. economic development met earlier this evening and we had a great update from our, um, I'm trying to find my notes lost here in all the paperwork, but uh, uh, there was so much discussed at this meeting from, um, the uh, gambling slots money, thanks to Mr. Phillips and his work on that. Um, all the great things that are going on in the county, the newsletter, a new, a new website, um, updated website for the economic development. Um, lots of good things happening. Is there anything else, Mark, you would like me to add to it that we, please read your minutes when they come. It was quite a, quite a good meeting. Uh, any other committee reports? Um, then I just have a question or a request of Mr. Geisinger. Uh, we did receive our year-end financial reports uh, earlier this week. Uh, are we going to be scheduling um, the accountants for a presentation? Yes, we are. We, I, I don't have to work it out with the fiscal I'm department and to get the actual date, but we'll have that coming up shortly. Yes. Well, accountants, auditors. auditors. What's the? <laughs> they're, 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 oh, he doesn't, he doesn't trigonometry, <laughs> algebra, right? Same thing, right? You are a math teacher. Okay, it from I'm, the math I'm teacher. out of my field of expertise. <laughs> I, I'll confess. Okay, so we'll look forward we'll to seeing short. uh, yeah. them uh, shortly. All right, uh, then we'll move into uh, liaison reports. Anything to report there, Mr. Warner? Okay, I, um, I had was fortunate enough to attend the Northampton County Outstanding Seniors Awards April 27th, held at uh, Graysdale. Uh, we had, uh, excuse me, this was held, Allison, it was held at the United Wesleyan Church, okay? Uh, 12 honorees, uh, amazing people, um, uh, just just fun to be with. Uh, uh, Representative Samuelson was there, uh, Mario Scavello, uh, myself, um, and it was just a wonderful event, and the acknowledgments were, were, were great. Um, it's all about volunteerism that, on that program, and um, you'd be surprised the people that are in their 70s and 80s are outrunning some of the people in their 30s right now. Um, I also was fortunate enough to attend the, the, the uh, Grace Dale uh, 39th Annual Volunteer Recognition Program on April 23rd, and uh, that's probably one of the most impressive things I've attended in a long time because of the volunteerism and the hours. Um, uh, 288 adults, 53 junior volunteers contributed 13,588 hours of service in 2016, and 152 volunteers served on a regular basis of 1,888 hours in 2016. I can't tell you how, how wonderful it was to be around people who volunteer their time and are dedicated to, to other people. So I just want to thank all of them. I want to thank Allison and administration for putting on a very nice program. Food, food was good, too. Food, food was very good. Um, and I just wanted to share that with the council. Very good. Thank you. Any other liaison reports? Hey, uh, just a quick note. Uh, the retirement board uh, will be meeting next Thursday to consider our uh, contract with the investment uh, advisor, so we'll look forward the, to that. Mr. Kissing, Mr. Warner, yep. The, the uh, Friends of Graysdale Foundation will have uh, a meeting Monday night at 7 o'clock at Graysdale on the first floor uh, with the founding members and the public that wants to attend. We'll have a, a couple people joining us that night to discuss some things. And uh, yes, we are getting money in, Mr. Good. Cusick. We are. That's good to hear. Yes. 
And, and people get a tax deduction. If yes, they, they do. That's very good. nice tax incentive. So. Okay. Um, any other liaison? Okay. Uh, clerk report? No report this evening. Uh, solicitor? No, no report. I will meet with Mr. Pennell and answer his question. Okay. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, a couple things. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the Easton uh, AP Politics and Government class. Uh, I hope you all did well in the test. I know it was this morning. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so that, that piece is over. Um, we'll be uh, happy to sign your agendas uh, for you uh, after the adjournment. Uh, that being said, uh, do we have a motion, motion by Mr. Bennell, seconded by Mr. Kraft. Uh, have a nice evening, everyone, and may the 4th be with you.